when we're trying to launch products now, it's a lot harder than it was back in the day. You could give away products for free. You could get reviews in exchange for the products. It was all legit. Things were great. That's obviously not there anymore. Now outside promotions and coupons that just got cracked down upon. So overall, what we're seeing is that advertising is becoming more and more critical as you go to launch new products, just because you don't have other options to help with these launches. So for general launch strategy, what we do is... Thank you for coming on, everybody. Really appreciate that uh, Joe has uh, agreed to come on and uh, share with us. It's nice to be able to collaborate across Ad Advance and Incremental Digital. My philosophy is when you do good work, there's uh, enough business in the space to keep everybody happy. And Joe has agreed to kind of come on and have uh, a list of questions from our team, learn from him as well. So Joe, can you take like one or two minutes, just introduce yourself and then uh, we'll get started. And again, thank you so much for uh, giving us some of your time. Yeah, just real quick quick background. So um, I'm CEO of Ad Advance, um, co-founders with Matt Wickland. And so just how I got started on Amazon is in like 2014, I actually started as a seller. Um, I'm a chemical engineer by background. And so I was selling these organic chemistry molecular model kits as a private label brand. And then from there, as I was scaling that business, I started reaching out to different people to manage my advertising. And what I was finding that at the time, you know, this is 2016, 2017 timeframe, there were a few people out there, but I found that the strategies that I were implement was implementing were actually a lot more complex. So light bulb kind of went off, you know, maybe I can help some sellers here and started at advance. Uh, from the early stages, we've really invested in like developers and we have our own custom software and everything that goes on in the back end. but then take the approach that, you know, there's some pieces that software is great for. There's other pieces that the manual approach is great for. So we just try to bridge the gap between the two. So we take a pretty data driven approach to advertising, but also realize that there's definitely an art in the sciences you're looking at. It. So that's just general approach that we take. Okay, so let's get started. The first question is, how do you approach a, a launch strategy? You have a new product. Uh, obviously, there's challenges with uh, new products, like, you know, small amount of reviews. And, um, uh, and then you have also the positive sides that Amazon gives you kind of a little bit more love in the, in the, in the honeymoon uh, phrase. How do you approach launch? And do you see it as an opportunity to gain uh, organic rankings and, and what's the way to kind of maximize that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, so for lunch in general, I, I think just taking a step back when we're trying to launch products now, it's a lot harder than it was back in the day. You know, so when I started selling in 2014, you could give away products for free. You could get reviews in exchange for the products. It was all legit. Things were great. Conversion rates would go up really quick because now you have all these great reviews and sales history. Um, that's obviously not there anymore. Now outside promotions and coupons that just got cracked down upon. So overall, what we're seeing is that advertising is becoming more and more critical as you go to launch new products, just because you don't have other options to help with these launches. Um, and so for general launch strategy, what we do is, um, typically what we want to focus on is the very high relevancy keywords from the start. So in general, we take a very targeted approach and for that targeted approach, we want to be really aggressive with it. So say we take, you know, and I'll just ballpark some numbers here, but we'll say five to 10 or 10 to 20, maybe max of like very targeted keywords. Um, we put those aside in a manual campaign. Um, and really focus on um, some of the highest converting placements. So like top of search can be a great one. Conversion rate tends to be about twice as high as like product page or rest of search. And so really the key thing that we're trying to do from the start, it's not, we're not optimizing for ACOS from the start. We're optimizing to try to drive those initial sales, um, to try to drive those with those sales, you get those great flags that this product is relevant for these keywords, these search terms. Now let me try to, but the algorithm is gonna start ranking it a little bit higher. Um, so we focus, I'd say probably like 80, 90% of the budget from the start with this very targeted um, campaign. But then at the same time, we have our base campaign structure set up too, starting to get more longer tail keywords, but, you know, that's more of a long-term play really from the start. Let's focus on the really high relevancy items. Let's try to drive the sales to those keywords that are going to convert as well as they can. 
Um, and then let's make sure that we're setting the expectation that right now, while we're watching ACOS, that is not our key goal. Our key goal is to drive those initial sales, get those initial reviews, improve the organic ranking. And then as we keep building on that, building up momentum, at that point, now we can shift more to like an ACOS or a margin approach as we go. And, and are you utilizing, um, let's say, only certain match types? Like we, we focus a lot on exact match early on as well. We have a very similar approach to it. Sure. Um, or are you utilizing phrase and broad and, and auto and, you know, uh, or is that only like a, sm- a that, that smaller part of the budget that you mentioned? Yeah, so usually we'll we'll focus more on exact. We can use phrase if we know that there may be some common terms that get thrown in front or the back. Um, so there's instances where we'll use phrase um, to try to get those different. Vid- Did your audio go out, Joe? Technical difficulties. Okay, so uh, so you, so you say in, on on a small basis, but mostly mostly exact. Um, uh, Andu, um, you wanted to chime in. You can un- unmute yourself. Hey, Joe, uh, one question. What uh, bidding strategy do you use in the beginning, in the first month, two weeks? Let's say the first two weeks. Yeah, great question. Um, honest, I, I like fixed bids a lot for initial launch strategies. And the key reason is that if we use, say, like dynamic down, um, when we first launch a product, conversion rates are going to be poor because we don't have many reviews. And with dynamic down, Amazon's going to potentially decrease the bids if they see that it's not converting from the start. Um, But for these highly targeted keywords that we have, we know that we're relevant. um, And it's just building up that initial social proof from the launch (laughs) strategies. Um, And so we like fixed bids um, for initial launch strategies, just to make sure that Amazon is not decreasing those bids on the keywords that we know that we're highly relevant for. Um, And then as we transition more to like an ACOS focus after the launch strategy, um, that's where we use dynamic down quite a bit more. Um, But we like fix from the start in general. Yes, what's your guys' take? Actually, I'm with you here. I think uh, fixed bid is much better than, for the same reason that you mentioned, it's better than dynamic bid and up only, up and down only. But we sometimes use that use that uh, up and down only. Sure. The other question that actually I had here is that there are two approaches for this. One is that put your low bid and go with the top of with the placement. If you are going for exact, you want to go for top of search play with the placement with 900 to bring your bid down and make sure you are securing that placement. The other one is like the other approach is with high bid. I personally like going with higher bids, but we have always this debate that which one is better or not. I I love to hear your take on that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, each case totally makes sense too. So the very low bid, say with a 900% placement adjustment, um, If you can get over that initial hurdle, because it seems like sometimes Amazon algorithms will screen out that initial low bid before adding in the placement adjustment, um, that definitely works to just target top of search. Um, We tend to take a more balanced approach where we won't go a super high bid, but we'll go, say, a middle ground bid, but then let's add a 200% adjustment for top of search or 100% adjustment up. So we want a 2x um bid for top of search versus the other placements um that's the way that we'll typically take it and that's the way that we typically approach like the bids versus placement adjustments um we want to set bids for the worst performing placement between rest of search product page and top of search and then use those adjustments up for product page or top of search you know be awesome if we could have the negative controls on the sponsor product side which we don't but um yeah so it, I, Personally, we kind of take a middle approach, but we want to push more towards those highest converting placements, which would be on the top of search side. And are, are you, you know, you, I know you have your own software. So how do you approach it? Do you start off manually without the software and let's say fixed bids? And I like the fixed bid approach because you're kind of telling the Amazon algorithm, like, I'm in control. Don't lower my bids, right? Sure. Or control my bid. So I, I like that approach. Um, sometimes with software too, um, if you're adding in like a target a cost you could have you know the bids lowered unless it's a very high target a cost so are you managing initially outside of your software or are you starting out right away you using uh and then transitioning in or are you starting out right away us- utilizing your your software 
Yeah, yeah, awesome question. Um, I'll say we are using our software, but essentially what we do is we append different tags to our campaign names um, based off of the strategy. And then our software can filter all these campaigns based off of the strategy and make the right adjustments for it. Um, so the answer to your question is that the software ignores ranking campaigns from a bidding standpoint um, mm -hmm. and also from a placement adjustment standpoint, um, just because, right. you know, what are you optimizing to? Right. Um, and so it's a much more manual, intuitive type judgment for ranking campaigns versus our general campaign funnel structure that's being managed with our software. Obviously, we're steering the ship on key goals for it. So. Yeah, when we look at like ranking campaigns itself, it's fully manually adjusted just because there's so much intuition that's required there and where you're setting these different items. Um, but the software is reviewing it. We just have the software not touch those campaigns. One more question. What about the bad campaigns? Do you use the first month bad campaigns for sales velocity? Uh, sorry, which which campaigns? The, the, the product targeting. targeting. Oh, product, product targeting. targeting. Uh, sure. Yep. So how do you use them? Uh, in what bidding strategy again? Yeah. For on on the launch side, I would say we focus more on the keywords from the start, just to try to get those organic rankings. Um, there can be instances, and it really depends on how aggressive our clients want to get. So if we want to be aggressive on the keyword side, and then we have some really direct competitors that we know that we're going to target from the start. Um, we can definitely expand onto the product targeting side. Um, typically, what we would do is we would incorporate the product targeting campaign more in our typical campaign funnel structure. Maybe we'd have more aggressive ACoS targets from the start just to get that initial traction because we know that conversion rate isn't going to be as good. Um, so I'd say it kind of falls in the middle ground between like our pure ranking strategy that we utilize on the uh, keyword side and the uh, the typical like campaign funnel structure that we have on the other side. So um, in general, we don't get as aggressive or as strict with that, We're typically using dynamic down. But if there are some good cases where, you know, like I have three competitors or I have a very niche product and there's one other person in the space, then you may want to incorporate in product targeting with maybe like a fixed bid strategy, get more aggressive on that. That could be a great way to like drive some more terms. Or in other cases, if you have like kind of a unique product where people aren't specifically going to search for it, like maybe it's an accessory for another product, yeah. like, you know, product targeting may be a much bigger piece of that initial launch strategy than say the typical, I'm going to target some keywords. So it's dependent. Um, I guess any other cases that you found that you really focus more on the product targeting side? Actually, Joe, I'm going to go quickly over what's our strategy. Same as you, we do our yeah. keyword research and we are highly targeted. We try to go from low search volume to medium search volume, not going after those uh, high search volume keywords because they are not helping us with rank. Sure. As you mentioned, it's a good strategy, maybe on the side. You can, with low bids, you can uh, target those search volume keywords. So the sure. segment based on the search volume that we have in three, four campaigns based on how many keywords we are targeting, we are trying to be pretty narrow, maybe 20, 30 keywords, as you mentioned, sure. and uh, go after top of search. We have a product targeting as well. Based on the products that we feel we might convert, we going after them and just uh, kind of adjusting the placement for product detail page for not top of search to sure. avoid showing up on top of search for them. And sometimes I think maybe it is good, even if you are not target, if you are not performing for that product, kind of it's a good signal for Amazon to, if they click on your product from a detail page of another product, sure. it's a good indication that you are yes. related to that product. So it helps with indexing. Sure. With Although we didn't use to do, we are not doing this, but recently I have realized, and the reason was that we were thinking Amazon doesn't know, your, it doesn't know your product and maybe the search terms or the keywords that they might show you is not related. But recently I have noticed the algorithm like have changed a lot for a sure. keyword, for a product that was in a launch phase with no information. We had an auto campaign and I realized, no, search, term was, search terms are really related. Sure. So maybe we have to start from the beginning with low bit, go after yeah. auto as well. So my question is that, what's your take on auto? Are you starting uh, auto from the launch or not? Yep. 
so we start auto from the launch and that really falls into like the the longer tail type funnel strategy that we have built out so we're definitely not as aggressive as our ranking launch campaign um, that we have on the manual side but we launch autos from the start and what you're saying, I definitely agree with. And Amazon, I mean, they've got AWS with their machine learning built in, and they're constantly getting more data and fine tuning these algorithms as they go. Um, and they have, you know, just billions and billions of data points to fine tune this stuff. Um, and we get to work with a lot of the different product teams too um, on the Amazon advertising side. So what I can tell you is that they're continually finding more and more information to tie into their algorithms to find the best options for us, um, tying into the category or the, the catalog itself and getting all the product detail items. Um, and then just looking at other comparable products as you start to have those click-throughs like you were saying between different product pages, now it's starting to link those together and it's just going to get better. Um, so yeah, in general, and just to quickly answer your question, yes, we, we definitely start with auto campaigns. It's just not a key focus from the start. But if performance is solid, we're naturally going to start allocating more budget to those auto campaigns and then feeding our funnel. What's, um, let's talk a little bit about um, campaign segmentation. Um, sure. I think everyone does things differently. And also I think campaign structure and segmentation is one of the most important things that we see sellers generally don't do right when we take over campaigns. I'm sure you uh, as well. Sure. Um, and one of the most important things. Um, how are you, you know, thinking about segmenting keywords? We all know that putting 500 keywords in one campaign, generally not a good idea. Mixing sure. the top search volume with the low search volume, long tail, generally not a good idea. How are you, how are you, thinking about, you know, segmenting keywords, um, as well as segmenting ASINs um, sure. in, in campaigns? Yeah, yeah, good question. Very, very broad question too, depending <laughs> yes. on the, the products and what you have too. And so, budget. And budget, yeah. So, so just in general, um, if we look at product segmentation, the key question that we're asking ourselves is, if we group these products together, say these variations together, um, are there going to be a ton of commonalities or common search terms that tie to these different products? So if we look at variations and say there's just color differences for this product, we'll segment all of those into a single campaign. Um, and we like to do that. So the other option is you could separate them all out. Um, for each of these items, there's going to be a, a give and a take. Um, and so when we group them together, all these search terms are contained in the same campaigns or ad groups. Now we're getting in a larger amount of data that we can make better bid adjustments and placement adjustments for. Um, the one piece that you lose is now, I can't say if somebody searches for blue and I have a bunch of different ads, I'm relying on Amazon to make that connection and show that blue product. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll actually create other campaigns um, that just, reference that those items that are different. So whether it's a color variation or a size variation, or say it's a wood product and there's different types of wood that it's made out of, like let's just have specific keywords that reference those differences as a separate campaign, but then all of the general keywords, let's keep in our general campaign funnel structure that we have. So that's, that's the typical approach that we take on like the ASIN side is, group the variations together if most of the search terms are gonna be very common, um, but then create separate campaigns that kind of hit on those key differences for those variations, separate out each of the, the variations um, and then target those specifics like color or size. I wanted to make a note on the uh, variation that you mentioned. Actually, sure. we did experiment recently and in, in I would say in all of the experiments we did, it was like four or five just uh, over past two weeks. Yeah. After combining, we had separate campaigns for variants. Sure. After combining the variants together and exactly your same method, uh, general keywords, we have all the variants together for specific keywords, color, size, we are launching campaigns for that uh, variant related keywords, we are launching different campaigns. Sure. I noticed in all of cases, the talk goes and spend goes down in, in parentheses level. So okay. 
You might not realize it, but when you combine them, you're actually seeing better results. When you are looking individually at the ASINs, you see your ACOS is good, your spending, but in parentation level, when you combine them, you realize that your spend goes down, your total sales is not increasing, your ta tacos is actually improving as well. Sure. And yes, my thought process is that actually we had this discussion with other managers as well. My thought process is that when you launch campaign for same keywords in uh, launch campaigns for same keywords in different for different ASINs, you're pushing the ASINs that are not supposed to be here. You're pushing some ASINs with higher cost per click, sure. replacing with the other variant. As a result, like kind of your spend goes up. That was our take on that, which what you said actually confirms that as well. Now, my question is, how would you decide which variant to keep? Would you leave all of them forever there or no? After a month, two months, from 10 variants, you might decide, okay, these two, three are the ones you want to keep and going on in our general combined uh, campaigns. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, overall, we'll typically keep most of the variations um, in the combined campaign. And the key reason is that over time, Amazon's algorithms are going to tune to what's the, the products that perform the best and show those more and more often. Um, so there's not too many instances where we'll actually shut down a variation in the combined campaign itself. Um, for those outside campaigns where we're targeting, say, like the green and the blue and the red, um, for those, we'll let performance really drive um, how they do. So say the red doesn't convert for whatever reason. Um, over time, we're going to just be keep decreasing bids overall, and eventually they're not going to get any pr impressions compared to the blue and the red as we go. Um, so I, I would say overall, there's not too many times where we're actually shutting down different variations, um, but be interested on, on your take on that. Actually, we, we do that. I think, in my opinion, I would look at the ASINs that are not performing or the A cost in the campaign is low, and I will probably I will remove that. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah, I would I would remove the variants that are not performing. If I have 10, I might end up being with three, four good performers instead of uh, investing money on the variant that is showing up, the ads showing up, but they are not performing. So kind of our approach is pausing some of them that are not the A cost is higher or higher conversion rate is low. Sure. And, and I think that's a good point. And, you know, we don't specifically look at these different campaigns on what to shut down, but at the same time, we're reviewing different products in general and we will pause different products if they're not converting. So, it, you know, it's not like we're specifically going okay. into these campaigns and looking to shut them down, but in our general reviews, um, we would get that flag too, where we would start pausing these if there were products that just weren't converting well. And, and as far as the actual competitor ASIN and keyword targeting, how do you think about segmentation in terms of, you know, you did keyword research, you found, you know, 250 relevant keywords that you want to target. Sure. Uh, are you grouping, you know, are you grouping match types together? Are you putting match types in separate ad groups? Are you segmenting, you know, by search volume, by similar keywords? Like, how do you sure. think about segmenting and, you know, the, the, the campaign setup? Yeah, yeah. So in general, what we'll do is, um, it depends. <laughs> so um, we, we have it set up where we can we can put, say, all manual keywords together in a single ad group. So we, we may do this in instances where there's not as many variations or keywords that are making their way in. Um, we have other campaigns where we separate it out into the different match types, um, broad, phrase, and exact as we go. Um, we have ranking strategies, which is just kind of like the launch strategies. Um, we separate those out into their own campaign where we have a little bit more control and we can either get more aggressive on an ACOS side or we can turn off the bid controls completely, say if we're just trying to own those keywords and it's not as much of an ACOS driver. So in, in general, what we do is we'll segment out some of those major keywords that we know we want to drive ranking for long term which is pretty equivalent to like the launch strategies that we just talked about. Um, and then we'll typically segment by match type 
um, just to give a little bit more control. Um, but there are instances where we actually group them all together um, and where we still have the campaign funnel structure going, but it stays in one ad group. Um, we just give ourselves some flexibility so we can reuse other campaigns whenever possible when taking over accounts. Let's talk um, a little bit about um, sponsored display. Um, so sponsored display, fairly sort of newer within the the Amazon ad types, you know, over over the last year. Um, when it originally launched, you know, we saw a very, very low cost per click um, sure. and we, we could afford to have, you know, a lot of targets, even ones that were not as close competitors, maybe they were complementary. Um, cost per click has increased definitely on, on sponsored display. Sure. Um, what do you have some, uh, like, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on, you know, what percentage of spend, you know, would you kind of put towards sponsored display? And then, you know, um, do you see that as more of in general, especially like category campaigns as like sort of top of funnel brand awareness type of, uh, of campaigns that should not be utilized, um, you know, uh, unless, uh, you know, if, if sellers already have, you know, budget issues or sure. generally high A costs, like in, in, you know, uh, in other campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. No, great question. Um, sponsor display is fun, but it's confusing how they have it set up um, just because it hits so many different parts of the funnel. Right. You know, so if you look at sponsor display product targeting, um, that's pretty comparable. I group that into like the sponsored product side. It's a much more like lower funnel type strategy. So those are going to be the ads that, you know, you just target different ASINs. They show up right below the buy box or the, the bullet points. Um, so those ones tend to perform about at the conversion rate of sponsored products. So I would say over in general, you definitely want to run the product targeting sponsor display campaigns. Um, you're not going to get a huge amount of volume, um, but right. you get a pretty good conversion rate. Um, like you're saying, a, tracking cost per click, I mean, it's gone up like 50% over the last year for sponsored display. So we're getting an awesome return from it before. Um, much more challenging now just because a lot more people are using it. Um, so you've got product targeting, very bottom of the funnel. Um, now you have like views remarketing. Um, so that's more of a lower funnel strategy, um, but because it includes offsite of Amazon too, um, conversion rates tend to be a decent amount lower. And so from an ACOS standpoint, it doesn't perform as well. I repurchases, repurchases is really cool for like consumable products. Um, so that can be great. They just expanded look back windows, which makes it much more useful now um, before it was limited to way too short of a time frame. Um, so repurchases is great depending on the product. If you have a product that's a one-time purchase, obviously don't use it. But if you have a consumable product, supplements or grocery or beauty, like that's a great spot to use that. Um, then once you start getting up to the other options like audiences, like category targeting, um, you're getting much broader. And so if the client's key focus is on ACOS and you're already approaching those ACOS levels, um, you're not going to get a good return on it from a ROAS or an ACOS standpoint. And so really when you want to apply these upper funnel strategies, therefore these solid brands that either have great margins on their products, like high ticket items that have a longer buying period or brands that generate a lot of cross purchases or a lot of repeat purchases. Um, for these higher funnel strategies from a, a ROAS standpoint, which only accounts for that first sale, a lot of times it's not gonna be profitable. But if you can get brands that have this higher lifetime value of the customer, now that new to brand customer can be worth a lot more than what ROAS would indicate. And so to get further up the funnel and use strategies like category targeting for sponsored display, you definitely have to be selective in the type of brands that really fit that mold for the higher lifetime value. Um, and then you really have to select how high you want to go up in the funnel. So I would typically always do product targeting for sponsored display. Then views remarketing could be a great next step. Um, helps to expand the market share a bit, get people back in. Repurchases is great if it makes sense for your product. And then once you get to like category targeting, um, at that point, you just need that brand with a higher lifetime value to really drive that return overall. 
Right. Um, yes. About uh, VCPM campaigns, did you start to use them on sponsored display? Uh, yeah, so we, we are testing them right now. Um, honestly, I don't have enough data to really give you a good overview on how it compares, um, but we are starting to test them. Um, and I will say too that, you know, for those brands who are going higher up in the funnel, um, sponsor display can be a great spot to start, but typically we'll transition over to DSP where we have a lot more control on retargeting. You know, we can establish different look back windows like category targeting. We don't have to go for the broad categories. We can add other filters to kind of segment that down. Um, so in terms of like higher funnel strategies, sponsor display can be a great spot to start. Um, especially if they don't want to make the jump to DSP. But for a lot of those higher funnel strategies that we're implementing, they're larger brands that are looking to spend more and we transition more on the DSP and, side. And to what, um, for those that, uh, to give some explanation to what Joe is saying on filtering within DSP, let's say I have a, a customer, let's say I have a, a keto um, chocolate bar. Within DSP, I can target people that both are buying grocery products on Amazon and are interested in keto, for example, right? And I can merge those audiences together to have a, a smaller niche subset. I cannot do that in sponsored display. In sponsored display, I'm like, either I'm targeting grocery or I'm targeting keto, but I can't cross layer these audiences that can try to get down to a smaller, more, more targeted level. And that was going to be part of my next question. At which point do you um, are you thinking about how you utilize, is it based on budget or where you go into, you know, sponsor display versus DSP? Sure. Yeah. Great question. Um, typically what we'll always You've been do... talking a lot about DSP like oh, over the last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So DSP, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to cover for sure. Um, what we'll do is we'll start out, and we'll build the base first. Um, a key mistake I see people making is going into high funnel strategies too quickly and not establishing that base first. Um, so for instance, I hear of horror stories where um, clients have gone to Amazon. Amazon says, hey, you need to spend 35 grand to run DSP. They say, okay, cool, let's give it a shot. And then Amazon sets up these really broad high funnel strategies without building the bottom of the funnel to actually convert them into sales. And so what will happen is that you'll get all these impressions, you'll really get brand awareness but it doesn't convert into sales because you don't have those follow-up touch points as you go. Um, so we always focus on building out the bottom of the funnel first, showing performance there, and then slowly working our way up. Um, in terms of going to DSP, like for our agency, we don't set like spend minimums for DSP. Um, but in general, I would say, you know, you probably want to be around at least the five to 10 grand a month that you're spending in DSP to make that jump. If you're spending less, I would probably just focus some of the higher funnel strategies on sponsored display. Hopefully you can see some decent results and then transition after that point. Yeah. Um, and then breakdown between higher funnel and lower funnel strategies, it really dependent on the brand overall. You know, there's some big brands I know that are spending two to three X on higher funnel strategies versus lower funnel strategies. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of sellers, it's going to be like 80% on lower funnel strategies and 20% on higher. Um, right. So totally dependent on the brand itself. Um, and how long-term they're thinking. Um, and then the perspective on just how you view advertising overall. If you take a return-based approach, which a lot of Amazon sellers do, and I totally get, um, you're not gonna spend as much on higher funnel strategies, but yeah, to totally dependent on, you, you gotta fill out the client. And then what we do is kind of incrementally work up as we go versus starting too fast on the, the upper funnel strategies. Um so I'll ask a couple more questions. I'll, I'll let I'll let some others chime chime in as well. Um, where do you see things moving? You know, there's um, a lot of talk on you know external uh, traffic. Um, we've recently started to test and run you know Google traffic into into sure. Amazon. Um, are you going in the same direction of you know uh, as well as influencer marketing on our end testing with with a couple of clients right now? Sure. Um, are you going in the same direction? Are you building, are you thinking about your own tool in terms of building out, you know, um, or, or leveraging other tools, but like, as far as like, okay, you know, Amazon cost per click is rising. Sure. Uh, organic sales are 
dropping, uh, you know, I used to be number five position and show up like at the top of the page. Now I'm number five position. You have to scroll three miles yep. before, you find that, before you find my listing <laughs> yeah. um, beneath, you know, a lot of other things. So how do you, how do you think about like where things are going and would you generally recommend external and like within your own software and, and agency um, love to get your take on, you know, sort of outside of Amazon? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, so overall, Amazon is pretty saturated with ads on their site. <laughs> I don't know how they can get many more in. Um, so like you're saying, like organic results now are pretty far down the page. I mean, uh, I see uh, I see more video ad placements coming to detail pages and I sure. see um, sponsored posts yep. um, on the on the horizon. So they will find a way. They will uh, find a way. I agree. Yeah. It, is, it is very saturated. <laughs> but it, yep. And like you're saying, so the couple items like video and then post, they're going to have to get creative and what they can charge us for in terms of advertisements on Amazon. Cause just the traditional sponsor products, brands, ad, they, I, I just don't see how they're going to be able to fit too much more in. Um, so that pushes us to offsite. So if we've mastered the advertising on site, yep, they're constantly giving us more features to optimize around, which is awesome for agencies like like us and you, because it gives if we can get in much more depth, we can find those areas that other people are missing. Um, so we're going to continually get more control, more reports, like brand analytics, like constantly pushing out new items like um, opening up APIs where we can pull in more like new to brand and higher funnel type strategies that we can incorporate in. Um, but I think where it's going is offsite, meaning using DSP to like pull people in from other sites because we're saturated on Amazon and we're doing everything we can there. And then it's other channels like you're saying. Um, so yep, we're kind of going down the same route and it's cool you guys are too, um, where we've got Amazon attribution tied in. So we're starting and we're taking some other channels and we're pushing people to Amazon. Um, but then included with that is we work with e-commerce sellers in general. Um, they are Amazon sellers, but the higher level, they're e-commerce sellers so, and so Amazon have, is one channel. Do you as an agency also run traffic to Shopify and, and, uh, websites or are you only marketplace focused? Uh, starting to test it. Yep. Huh. Yep. And so right now, primarily going back to Amazon, mm -hmm. um, but starting to test going to different sites like a Shopify site. Right. Um, and so, you know, we're learning a lot. We know yep. exactly what sellers are looking for. Um, I think in general, agencies like ourselves, um, going to different channels, it's not that hard. Like once you, you the, there's tons of parallels between Amazon right. and everything else. And once we've mastered DSP and sponsored ads, we're really well-rounded to jump into these other channels. And so I, overall, I, I think that's kind of the next area where it's Amazon is one channel. Yep. We've mastered that now. Let's look at the other ways that we can get more options to help set our sellers apart. Yeah, it makes makes uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I also see, I think, where Amazon is going to have to start giving you more data in order to spend more on ads. So my theory is that today Amazon doesn't really give me; they give me a repeat purchase rate, but I don't really know what is my average order value on a on a customer on a product. And if I knew that, I'd probably be willing to spend more, which means I wait. Maybe you know, maybe I'd be if I understood the metrics better. And I understood that I'm selling, uh, you know, I just got off the, the, a meeting with a seller that sells baby moccasins. And I said to him, do you get repeat purchase? Because he sells a zero, you know, infant size. And then he sells the three to six month size and, you know, the six to 12 month size. Right. So if he understood that when he, so, and actually he told me he spends more money on the keywords around newborn you know, moccasins sure. than maybe the six to 12 month size, because he knows he's got a certain a purchase, repeat purchase, but Amazon's not giving you that exact data. And if Amazon gave you that exact data, you'd be willing to spend more. And if they want people to be able to sustain the higher cost per click, I think they're going to have to give you that. And probably why they've given you search volume data with, you know, product opportunity explorer, you know, uh, et cetera. So, um, yeah. you know, I, it's, um, it's good to see, um, you're sort of looking at the same things um, that we're looking at and that sellers are thinking about 
on, you know, how do you drive traffic from, from Google and Pinterest and, you know, influencers and um, DSP and bring it into Amazon and also be able to impact, um, you know, rankings uh, along the, along the same way. Um, Mansoor, do we want to open up to maybe a few people on the team that might have questions for the last 12 minutes or so with Joe? I have a question, Joe. We, we are trying to build a bigger structure on the sponsored products campaigns. And I saw you're talking a lot in your videos about long tail keywords. Sure. I'm curious if you split them about the impressions of the search volume and the next the next question, how many keywords you add per campaigns in the long tail keywords? And after, how do you calculate the right budget for the amount of the keywords? Sure. And in what match do you use them? Yeah, yeah. No, oh, great question. Um, so overall, when we're looking at different campaigns, um, in terms of finding long tail keywords, a, so auto campaigns can obviously be a great source that you can just funnel in. Um, what we've started doing is using all the different match types. We weren't utilizing broad as much. Um, and so one fun thing that we're doing is starting to find, say, our top 10 to 20 performing keywords, say in a phrase or exact. And it, if it has a lot of different keywords that are like words associated with that keyword, broad can be a great way to really expand the amount of long tails that you're generating um, just because they can be sorted and shuffled in any way shape or form and maybe just by using phrase we're excluding some of those um, so we're utilizing broad a lot more to get more long tail keywords along with auto and then we have our phrase and exact so just your general campaign funnel structure and i'm sure you guys are doing something similar there um, in terms of number of keywords, um, really it's dependent on the product and what we're finding in terms of like search term reports, but then, you know, from our own intuition to how deep are we going to get. Um, if anything, we're going to kind of uh, lean towards the, the point where we're not adding as many keywords in um, and just letting those naturally generate and expand and prove themselves through conversions um, versus the other side, which is more like a keyword stuffing. You know, once you get into multiple hundreds of keywords that you're adding in without previous test data, um, you can spend a lot to figure out what's actually working. We'll lean more towards what's been proven out. Um, let's take those initial like key phrases to help generate more long tail keywords. Um, we take a much more conversion based approach versus an impression based approach for these keywords. At the end of the day, we want to see what's truly driving sales. And then from that standpoint, we move it down the funnel. So say we have a keyword that converts in auto. Um, typically, what we'll do is we'll move it to phrase next. Um, sometimes we'll move it to both phrase and exact as we go. Um, for broad, we typically only use broad for some of our higher converting or our higher performance plus many words in the keyword or the search term um, in terms of broad. So we don't use broad as much just because sometimes it can get a little bit too broad if you put too many keywords in there. Um, so typically we'll go from like an auto to phrase slash maybe auto to phrase and exact um, and then utilize broad just to generate some more longer tail performers um, based off of the highest performance keywords that we've got. Uh, hi, Joe. So my question is related to DSP. Let's say you have, you have a brand that is that you see is mature enough in search advertising that you see, okay, we can do good for DSP here. Sure. But what's the criteria that you select the products? from it that, okay, these are the products that are gonna probably gonna perform well for DSP. So what's the general criteria for it? Yeah, yeah, great question. So the first thing that we start with is what's the overall goal for running DSP? Um, so if we're trying to use this as a, an additional channel that's more return focused, um, meaning lower funnel strategies, um, the key way that we pick products is based off of the amount of traction that those products are currently getting. So like good lower funnel strategies that you can utilize for DSP is like retargeting, um, repeat purchases, cross purchases if you have different products that sell really well together. And then as you start working your way up the funnel, now you're getting to more of like a brand building higher funnel strategy. So, you know, kind of in the middle is like competitor targeting. But then if we go way up, now we're going to category targeting. So first question that I'd start with is, you know, what is the key goal for DSP? Is this just to expand on what we can do with sponsored ads? And if it's a ROAS based approach we're taking overall, um, then it has to have that initial traction to be able to provide large enough audiences that we can target with DSP to make it meaningful. 
Um, if the key goal is, all right, we've tapped out the lower funnel strategies and we're really looking at longer term brand building, we have the solid brand, we have a high lifetime value of our customer, um, then at that point, it opens up the door more to be selective on, you know, what are those key introductory products we have going into that brand um, and taking more of a strategic approach versus just a purely number based approach. But obviously, you know, the best performers are going to work their way up quite a bit more there too. So definitely strategy based. Um, but then also tying back to the numbers too. So my question is, uh, when it comes to uh, decreasing tacos, did you try the strategy of like uh, decreasing bids or even pausing keywords where you are already ranked organically on top of search? And if mm -hmm. yes, did this have good results for you? Yeah, yeah. So it's always a tough question there. Um, so for ranking campaigns and strategies that you have, it's not a direct correlation um, to your ranking. And sometimes if we turn them off, we don't see the impacts to ranking for a little while. Um, and so to reduce tacos overall, say you're ranked organically number one. Um, and you're generating a lot of organic sales with that. Um, typically our approach would be is to let's start working down how aggressive we're being on those ranking strategies. Um, but I'm pretty hesitant to just turn it off completely. We've had multiple different case studies where say an ad gets shut off due to like an Amazon flag that, you know, causes ads to stop running. Um, when we haven't tried to stop them running, but they got shut down by Amazon. Um, and there's been many cases where Organic rank doesn't respond right away, but then we can start seeing that drop pretty quickly. And the tough piece is right now trying to regain those organic rankings. Um, it's, it's tough. Uh, and so what my approach would be if trying to reduce tacos is ranking strategies um, is definitely a great spot to look at, especially if you're solid organic ranking. Um, I would just start to work the results down, not be overly aggressive on reducing spend from the start and then tracking performance, making sure you're not seeing any negative results there. Um, and then, you know, in general, if you're trying to decrease tacos overall, um, you can get a lot more specific, focus on the highest converting products, really try to weed out some of the poor performers that naturally decreases spend, which helps your tacos. So, um, but yeah, great question from the ranking standpoint, I would just say, just, we take a cautious approach as we're reducing ranking strategies, just to make sure we give enough time to see the full impacts of what we're doing. Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank, uh, Joe, uh, Thank you so much, uh, Joe Shalrood of Ad Advance. Thank you so much for for uh, for coming on, uh, answering questions. I think it was really valuable for everybody here, uh, for our team, um, and for those that uh, that will be uh, watching this. So really, uh, really appreciate. Um, how can people get in touch with you, Joe, if they want to follow you? I know you post a lot on both Facebook and uh, LinkedIn uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. So Facebook, LinkedIn, LinkedIn's a great spot to connect. Um, we've got our podcast, which is called The Ad Project. If you listen to that, make sure you listen to the interview with Laron. Um, yeah, and website overall at advance.com. But those are the key places. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you coming on.